They used to make fun of the big Cadillacs and Lincolns of the 50s, call them land yachts. This is a land yacht. It's an actual yacht that I'm driving on land. So there you go. You feel like the captain of a ship on this thing. It's hilarious. Well, you show up at your yacht club in this thing in 1916. Oh, man, you're the the guy. Welcome to the episode of Jay Leno's Garage Pandemic Edition. Uh, This thing just keeps rolling on. But we are committed to doing a new video every week, and the car we're featuring today, my 1916 Simplex Crane. This is one of the most outrageous custom-bodied cars of the custom-bodied car era. A little history first. Simplex is an old name. It's a very, very old name. Simplex is Latin for simple. And uh, at least here in America, it originated with a company in Danvers, Massachusetts, making steam engines. They called their engines the Simplex. Uh, Willem Maybach, when he built his uh, early four-cylinder engines, he used Simplex. And then Simplex was built in different countries, uh, certainly here in America. Uh, And they were usually four-cylinder, high horsepower, which was 35, 60, 90 horsepower. Extremely powerful cars in the uh, era from the early 1900s to the mid-teens. Not the most refined cars. And then in 1915, uh, Simplex merged with... Henry Middlebrook Crane, he was an engineer. He was known for building extremely conservative, I think it's fair to say, chassis, dependable, quiet. Uh, His engines were uh, more or less a copy of a Silver Ghost Rolls-Royce. They called this the American Rolls-Royce, this engine. You'll see when I open the hood. They merged, I think, if I get this right, July 15th, 1915, something like that. And they built the Simplex Crane. And this was a top of the line automobile. This car was $10,000 in 1916, which was a tremendous amount of money when a Model T would be bought for a few hundred dollars. A six cylinder, what is it, 568 cubic inch, I think it is. Uh, well, I'll, we'll get into the engine a little bit later. I'll show you that. Uh, But as you can see, it's modeled on the lines of a skiff or a boat or actually a cigarette boat. That was quite the rage in the early teens, putting huge automotive engines into lightweight boats to, uh, don't forget, everybody was in sailing ships at that point. So having a motorboat was was really something. Uh, And it's very nautical in its theme. Uh, These are your air inlets here. You enter from the center like a boat. You go around the back and then you walk to the front. It's got a propeller on the back of it. It's, it's just interesting. It was built by Holbrook. They built uh, bodies for Duesenberg and other, uh, Pierce Arrow, a lot of marks like that. A very conservative, very old school money. So this was considered quite racy. You know, this was something a young cad would have or a single guy on the prowl, that type of deal, you know. so. Uh, yeah, it's an interesting car. There's a great story about this in Automobile Quarterly. I think it's volume, uh, number 11, volume four. Uh, they do a whole story on this. This car has been documented literally from the day it left the factory. Uh, it went through a number of prestigious uh, automobile collectors in the 30s and 40s, eventually winding up at Harris Collection. Uh, and Harris did a full restoration on it. Uh, I got it from Hara, it needed to be restored again, which we did. My friend Randy Ema, who was uh, the Duesenberg guru, he did the restoration on this for us and did, a, as you can see, a beautiful job. Wonderful running car. Um, it's about 110 horsepower, which is pretty good for 1916. That's unbelievable, 110 horsepower. I'm not sure what it weighs. It can't be lightweight because this is mahogany and teak. And this is all, I guess, what they call steam bent wood. I have no idea how they do that. Uh, That is woodworking was one of those skills I never even attempted. As you can see, it's an impressive car. Let's take a look at the engine. Well, impressive looking motor, you have to admit. I think I said 568 cubic inch before. 563.7, so that's exactly what it is. This is obviously not the carbureted side. Uh, This is your water pump here. You have a battery and coil ignition. This is a fascinating piece of kit, this here. This is a 
uh, air compressor, tire pump. This is quite common on cars in the teens because people getting out and driving more, roads are still not paved for the most part. They got a lot of flat tires. So the way this works is, I'll show you. See this engages like that. You start the engine and of course that activates the, the pump. You take the hose from out under the uh, seat and you hook it up, you fill up your tire and then you disengage it and you drive away. Notice this fan here. Uh, horn is right here. My favorite, oh, here's something kind of nice. I'll show you, this is your, you have a work light. You sort of crank it out like this. You say, oh, well, there's a problem, Johnson. Right there, fix that. You see there, and then you, when you're done, you reel it back in again. My favorite thing is this fuse box under the hood here. It looks like something that would go in an apartment building in the Bronx, you know, just one of those 50 apartment things. You've got this massive fuse box, but it's, it's pretty cool. All this was specially made for Simplex. Notice you have a rubber cushion in here to take out some of the vibration. The, it's a water pump, the copper pipes. It's just beautifully, beautifully detailed, beautifully blue, beautifully done. You got an oil can here just to do a little lubrication. Uh, you got your starter motor there. Uh, yeah, impressive. It really is. It's fun to open the hood and see people go, ooh. What you have here are two blocks of three cylinders each. These were cast. Now, of course, you cast the whole six cylinder engine, the whole V8 all at once. But back in the day, when you had a cylinder block like this, you, you would do three and three because if you screwed up one cylinder, you didn't have to throw away all that metal. Like in the early cars, I did them one at a time, like on my uh, big uh, Benz Mercedes with the aero engine. Each one of those is cast separately. Then they got their confidence that oh, we can do two at a time. Oh, we could do three at a time, like they did here. Then eventually they were able to get machines to the point where they could do six at a time without screwing the whole thing up. But uh, yeah, it's, 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 it's kind of cool. Come on, let me show you the other side. Okay, here's your carburetor, which looks like some huge toilet bowl unit, doesn't it? That's like, look how much gas it holds, oh my God. Uh, it costs you a beautiful intake here, copper. Uh, these are your priming cups here. And I'm proud to say, I've got the original 1916 spark plugs, which is kind of cool. They're not in it right now. I lend them to my friend. My friend Rick Rollins borrowed them for a while for his, but he was kind enough to give them back, and uh, i got to put them back in here, but they work fine. Steering box is here. This is your tickler here for your carburetor. Incredible workmanship on this car. Just beautifully detailed, beautifully done. Uh, this car doesn't have very many miles on it. As I mentioned before, it was sold at the, uh, off the floor of the San Francisco Auto Show. A guy named Baxter bought it. Uh, he bought it for $10,000, which is a huge amount of money. He kept it a long time. And I think his children then sold it. Did they sell it? Somebody sold it. To In 1960, Harris got it. They restored it. And then uh, I got it from the Imperial Palace, who got it from the Harris auction. I bought it from the Imperial Palace 25 years ago, something like that. And then we did a complete restoration that Randy did just a beautiful job. These are the original colors. Everything is as it was. There's nothing modern on this car. We haven't updated it other than I use an Optima battery, as I like to use, because they don't, they don't leak. And the Optima has been in this 10 years, and it still runs and starts fine. So let's, let's shut this down and work our way around the inside of the car. Notice there's no brakes on the front, which is fairly common for cars of this period. Four-wheel brakes didn't really come in until, uh, I guess, late 20s, uh, excuse me, late teens, early 20s. Mark Burkett, uh, the Swiss engineer, he was a genius and invented the, uh, the mechanism to allow you to, see what would happen the reason, another reason mechanical brakes weren't on the front because people thought they'd stop too quickly was the fact that if you turned the wheel, well, with rod brakes, with non-hydraulic brakes, you had rods, so the rod would pull, so the brake would grab if you turned the wheel too much, so they didn't bother to put brakes on the front. But Burke had uh, invented the mechanism that allowed it to maneuver and pivot 
and still be able to apply the brakes. Burkett is the designer of the Hispano Suez. One of my favorites, just a genius. Him, Duesenberg, W. Bentley, Lanchester. Uh, there's just a, a whole bunch of those guys that were the geniuses of, uh, of mechanical devices in the uh, turn of the last century. Come on around here. I'll show you the, how you get in this thing. Before we get in, my favorite thing about this era of car was the manual that you got with it. I mean, you get all the information. Look at this, just incredible, beautifully detailed wiring diagram. You can trace everything. And this car is 100% original. I mean, it's restored, but I mean original in the sense that uh, it hasn't been upgraded uh, to 12 volts or anything like that. Yeah, I mean, every, how to adjust the, every, every possible thing is in here. Nicely detailed. There's the gasoline delivery system. No, I'm talking like that, it's an American car. But anyway, as I said, like a boat, you enter from the rear. It's a little awkward to get in with the top up. You step up here, and then you've got to do this, and then come all the way around. Wonderful details here, like this clock. The way it works is you turn it out, you pop it out, little tab pops up. It is now, what time is it now? 10 to 11. Okay, I'll turn it like this. Here we go. I love cars with hand-wound clocks versus electric. I love when all the systems are independent. I like having a mag instead of a battery and coil. I like this because if the battery goes dead, the clock doesn't die, <laughs> which I realize if the battery goes dead, you got bigger problems. I just like the fact that you're not relying on one thing. Okay, then you slide that back in, and there you go, the clock is running. Okay, this is your fuel pump. When you want to start the car, you pump that up until you see a pound or two pounds on the gauge here. This is your voltmeter. This is your ignition. When you start it, you start it on a battery and coil. Once it's running, you switch it over to mag. Okay, emergency brake, four-speed gearbox, gas, oil pressure, ammeter, speedometer, odometer, tripometer, and then you have enrich or lean out the fuel mixture and then all your various light switches. On here you have retard the ignition, uh, spark, full advance, and then this is a hand throttle as well. And then you have various lights here that light up on the dashboard. You got these wind wings. Uh, it's a comfortable place to be. Here we are at the rear of the car. Notice the twin spares. Notice the sort of playful Propeller on the back, bit of whimsy, as they used to say. You have these little grease cups here, or oil cups, I guess. You, you fill these with oil, and this eventually keeps the uh, spring shackles lubricated. You have hundreds of lubrication points on old cars like this. There's another one there, there's another one there, more on the other side. This is your filler here. Uh, th you've got a gas shut off there. This car is rare, and it has a gauge on the dashboard to see how much fuel. In the old days, most of the times, the gauge was just. Uh, stuck on the back of the tank. This is, you have a stoplight here. This is your rear light. People really didn't drive at night back in those days. You know, the point of headlights in those days was to uh, alert pedestrians that someone was coming. They didn't really light up the road, so most people really didn't drive at night. Uh, it was just not a common thing because cars are not reliable, and then you broke down and you're stuck outside all night, you know, so. It just was not that common, but it got more common as, uh, as the years went on, actually. But in the teens, driving at night was not really uh, something most people did. Uh, we're going to put the top down, so I probably need to undo these. Uh, just a beautifully made top here. I haven't put it down because I just never wanted to get it all wrinkled. But uh, it's a bit of a chore to do all this. You should have your man do these things, actually. Johnson! Well, Johnson's not here because of the uh, COVID thing, so I got to do it myself.
all right, it's it's an hour later, and I fi finally got the <laughs> finally got the top down. I, I didn't put it down properly. It's all folded into itself. You know, I, I have to admit, this car was at Pebble Beach like 20-something years ago, and this is the first time the top has been down. Usually I drive with the top up, but I thought, for this it might be more fun to put the top, top down. It's no fun putting the top down, okay? This is why you have your man do it, like it says in the book. You, you know, this place, when this thing was built, people had a house full of servants, and Johnson, get in here, and then they would do it. But uh, this is doing it myself. Okay, we're about ready to fire it up. Let's go through the procedure. Uh, the nice thing about not having the top up, it's easy, much easier to actually get in the car. Ocean looks pretty calm. Nice day to go sailing, come on. I'm going to make the mixture rich. Full advance. Then go to Magneto. Magneto spark is stronger. When the Magneto is spinning, it puts out a stronger spark than the battery and coil. All right, let's adjust the mixture. Tally ho. Love this massive gear lever. Release the brake, and we'll take it next door, we'll put it up on the lift, and we'll show you what the underside of this thing looks like. Okay, we've got our crane simplex up on our sterile corny lift. These lifts are great. I give you a chance to see what the underside of the car is like. As you can see, I keep it pretty clean under here. This is a 25-year-old, if not longer, almost 30-year-old restoration. Uh, there's your brakes. You've got two brakes on the rear wheels, two brakes on each rear wheel. You have an outer brake, you can see that there, and an inner brake. I believe uh, one is the emergency brake and one is, of course, the regular brake pedal. Okay, there's your springs, fairly conventional. There's your muffler there. No cutout because they didn't want to be rude and make noise. The only modern concession is a battery disconnect switch right there. There's your speedometer drive. Uh, this is a ladder type frame, As you can, can you see that? Okay, uh, heat treated alloy, it's, it's pressed steel. Uh, it's now at the front, it's 30 inches uh, at the front compared to 44 inches wide at the rear. Uh, let's move up to the engine. There's the transmission, massive thing, the size of this crankcase on this thing. This has, uh, it sounds ridiculous, three main bearings, and it develops 110 horsepower at about, eh, about 1800 RPM. Uh, you have both valves on the same side it's an L-head design. Which I guess is another word for flathead, pretty much. Look at the size of that drain plug. There's your front springs there. Just a massive crankcase. Look at that. I, I, you know, I forget what this thing oils. I think it just says in the book, put in a lot. No, it doesn't say that, but uh, that's pretty much what I do. Let's just say you put it in by the gallon, okay? There's another grease point there. Of course, your drive shaft, more brakes. As you can see, I wiped this down whenever we had it up on the lift, so it looks pretty good. Ooh, something a little, a little bit of uh, something. Maybe a gasket there, I'll have to replace that, okay. But as you can see, massive construction, very conventional, nothing unusual here. Uh, Crane was a pretty conventional engineer, just massively strong uh, frames. That was his thing. As I said, you see, the, see it gets narrower as the frame goes to the front. 
44 inches at the front, 30 inches at the rear. Okay. I think that covers just about everything. We did the brakes. Did I miss anything? Anything people might question? Let's see. That's our battery uh, charger plug right there. Uh, oh, I need to get under here and give each one of these a twist. Well, they got cotter pins in them, so I don't need to, but I get a little bit of weepage there. But I do take this out quite regularly. It's, it's fun to drive. And uh, let's take it for a spin. I like this car with the top down. You know, I haven't had the top down in years. They just take it out and go around the block. But, you know, it's so open and you sit up so high. It's hilarious. Perfect California day for this car. And it drives very nicely. 110 horsepower It's not much today. But back then, and it's a torque monster, too. I love these big, lazy engines, you know, because they have so much torque. You just let the clutch out, and you just push forward. There's no tachometer on this thing, but I imagine eh, 2200 is probably the end of the world. You feel like the captain of a ship on this thing. It's hilarious. Turn, the turning radius isn't bad for such a big car. It's 100 and what, 43 inch wheelbase on this thing, I believe. That's probably because it's thinner in the front than at the back. Well, you show up at your yacht club in this thing in 1916. Oh man, you're the, you're the guy. You want to find some nice two-lane roads. It's a little busy here for this thing. Although the brakes aren't bad, it stops okay. If you use them both, the handbrake in conjunction with the foot brake. There's no synchros, of course, but you got these big giant gears and they just sort of mesh together, so it works okay. The thing I love the most about this car is just the level of detail, all the nickel on it. It's just, just amazing. I mean, just bending this wood, I have no idea how you go about that. It's just beautifully done. You know, much like the English Rolls-Royce, this car is pretty conventional. It's just everything is built to such a high standard and extremely well. That's what Crane brought to Simplex. Uh, Simplex bought out Crane, and they only built these about two years, and World War I started, and that pretty much put the kibosh on everything. So there's not too many of these around, and this was really for the, I mean, this was a rich person's car, just crazy how expensive it was. But you know, ignition and gear shifting and clutch, it's all so smooth, it all works so nicely. It's quite modern in that respect in being extremely dependable. I've never gotten stuck in this car. I probably shouldn't say that because I get stuck now. But everything works, you know? N nothing radical here. Just, you know, quiet, flathead, easy to work on, cylinders come off easy. Only three main bearings is kind of scary, but you're not turning very many revs, so it's not too bad. And it's a great car for California. Beautiful day like today sitting up high like an SUV, and quite smooth. Watching my temperature gauge, perfect, completely normal. You know, these slow running engines don't really overheat very much because there's not a lot of friction. I mean, there's no tack when I'm probably running 700 RPM, 600, something like that. It's a great car at 40 miles an hour. You, know, you don't want to be going 60 or 70 in this thing. It'll do it, you know. It won't stop, but it'll do it. Oh, I'll drive there. They used to make fun of the big Cadillacs and Lincolns of the 50s, call them land yachts. This is a land yacht. It's an actual yacht that I'm driving on land. So there you go. Everybody was surprised when Holbrook built this car, because I said before they were a pretty conservative company, and this was considered sort of pretty wild looking back in the day. And I, and I guess it still is today. But boy, it's a whole different car with the top down. With the top up, you're sort of like this, and you can't see anything. And Now, this is the sort of road you would have driven this car on. You know, 30 miles an hour, not a crazy LA street. Just all kinds of torque. Any gear, it'll pull away. 
Yeah, I'm, I have no idea what this car weighs. It, it can't be light, because I look at those springs, and boy, they're, they're like this. It's probably, and so I'm sure it's 4,000 pounds easy. I mean, driving fast cars is fun, you know, but it's not all about going fast. Sometimes it's just a certain amount of pleasure in negotiating something like this, which is just a precision instrument for the time. I mean, this was a top of the line car. And even though obviously there's no power steering or power, even four wheel brakes or anything like that, you can feel the craftsmanship in this thing. Let me, as you can see, it's got Armstrong steering. But once you're on the move, it's not bad. The gears just slot nicely into place. Just like butter, with butter. You always want to use your transmission for slowing down on these things. Going down a hill now, so I'll put it in second gear and just let it coast and have the compression save me on the brakes. Because the brakes, <laughs> this is the kind of car that invented brake fade. I like it shifted in the third now. You can see why it was called the American Rolls-Royce. There are a lot of cars in this period, I think, compared with the Rolls-Royce. Certainly the Pierce Arrow, certainly the Pierce 66, which had an engine actually twice as large as the Rolls-Royce. This is sort of a copy of a Ghost, but the level of workmanship is unbelievable. I mean, it's fun to do the muscle cars and the supercars and all that stuff, but sometimes it's fun to look back, see where we've been, how far we've come. And this is a classic example of that. Oh, you know the cool thing about this? You know what the guarantee on this was? You know what the warranty was? For life. This car was guaranteed for life as long as it stayed with the original owner. They would fix it for the rest of your life, which is, hey, talk about standing behind your product. Oh my God. Well, again, thanks for watching these pandemic editions. You know, this is the kind of car I would love to have my crew with the overhead shots and all that kind of stuff, but it's just not possible. You know, we just like to make sure we have enough product out there. You know, we like to have new videos every week and life gives you lemons, you make lemonade, you know, you do it yourself. So thanks for watching and I uh, hope you enjoyed uh, looking at the only Crane Simplex gift bodied car in the world. Thanks you guys, see you later. Mm-hmm. <laughs>